वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन मैं रिक्वेस्ट एवरी वन टू प्लीज टेक दर सीट्स आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू हैड अ वंडरफुल इवनिंग ये स्टडे एंड आई होप ऑल द सेशन वे वेरी फुलफिलिंग एंड इंसाइटफुल टू ऑल टूडे ऑल्सो वी हैव सेवरल की एंड पर्टिनेंट सेशन विद रेलिवेंट थीम्स एंड टॉपिक्स प्लान फॉर टूडे and as you know that there are several parallel sessions going on in various halls so here we have the climate proofing of future grids and advanced materials for extreme weather events as you know that weather events are becoming extreme and more frequent the electric grid we operate today have equipment and systems designed for the weather conditions that existed in the 20th century and we continue to buy and build new transmission and distribution grids with the same old specifications which of course no longer can withstand the present weather conditions becoming more and more extreme so there is an urgent need to <clears throat> revisit the design and specification as well as maintenance practices of the equipment in order to climate proof the electric grid so we will now start the session and i'd like to now extend a very warm welcome and invite on stage we have with us our chair and moderator and also our theme presenter shri ravi sitapati may i request you sir to please join us he is a chairman of biosiris and working group chair of india smart grid forum please welcome him with a big round of applause <laughs> may i now invite our esteemed speakers to kindly join in mr michael potter founder geeks without frontiers and senior fellow international institute of space commerce who will be joining us virtually has he joined us uh, do we have mr michael potter online yeah so we would like to now invite our other speakers to uh, join us on stage mr stefan ten bolen head of institute institute of energy Transmission and High Voltage Engineering, University of Stuttgart. Mr. Arindam Maitra, AVP of Grid Modernization at LNT Power Transmission and Distribution, PTND, USA. Mr. Fezan Khan, founder and CEO of Tensor Dynamics Private Limited. So, without any further ado may i request session chair and moderator to kindly make his well opening remarks and moderate the session over to you actually this is the beginning of a discussion that took place in isgf almost 6 7 months ago the notion is something and i'll start putting certain practical observations and then you tell me as the audience whether it's something worthwhile pursuing or it is just an academic exercise So in last distribution utility meet in Bhuvaneshwar, we had a similar discussion with Tata Power and others. And I'm, it is my belief. I've written three or four articles. It's my belief that we need to at least start paying attention to this area before we strand a lot of our electrical assets, which are in trillions of dollars around the world. It's not a small amount. So let me create the first session. If you look at India's standards for thermal equipment or, or thermal part of you know electrical equipment. it's 40 degree ambient maximum but there is a clause and it is that but that gets you it says that 24 average 24 hour average prior to that should be 30 degrees which means if you have a maximum ambient of 40 your night time cooling should be 20 so that you have a 24 average of 30 so then i asked a few folks around you know what that may be true 25 years ago but it is true for india today it isn't So if you take like delhi which goes to 49 50 degrees you're not going to get 10 degree night night temperature so that you can go back to your 30 degree average which is the second part of the conversation so when i found a few folks in the middle east i found a few folks everywhere and they all now seem to agree that our standards perhaps are dated fairly dated and the question therefore is what do we do so r r mehta was there in the bhuvaneshwar uh, conference and and so we had a long chat and we said how do we manage this because if we leave it alone the regulatory part of the standards group will say you know what let's put a 10% uh, derating 
or let's put a 15% derating on your electrical equipment. Aye. And that would essentially strand everything. Right? It's a okay? lot of money. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, so the question is... Testing, one, two, three. I think you need to mute it. Uh, so the question, therefore, is how do we manage it? So let me give a second part of that equation, right? So in order to manage it dynamically, I have to look at three pieces. I have an electrical piece of equipment, let's say transformer, let's cable, which we know we have loaded it, and therefore what is the current operating temperature at t is equal to zero. I know for the next one hour what is the predicted load it should handle. So I should be able to put it in my digital twin or through some kind of a formula to see, you know, if it can take it, what will be the temperature at t plus one? Will it add 5 degrees, 6 degrees, 10 degrees, whatever, right? It could be a cable. And then at the end of T plus 1, I should say, should I allow this to cool off? Or does it still have headband, headroom band on the thermal rating to be able to take on a part load going forward? So unless we are able to get thermal mapping or thermal rating of that in a dynamic basis, we really do not know what our static calculations and planning will ever get us anywhere. So that, that is number two. Number three, you take cables, and everybody forgets about cables because they're buried somewhere, nobody cares after that. If I take a 90 degree rated conductor, which is what most of us have in the world, and I add only seven to 10 degrees to the temperature of the conductor, going to 102, there are reports published that the factor, the life factor of the cable decreases by 30 to 40%. So the question is who's monitoring it? Nobody. All we have is a whole bunch of IEEE standards and other standards that say, you know, for this particular formation, derate it, do this, do this, do this. But nobody really has gone and paid attention to today's scenario for a cable that was purchased 40 years ago. So we have a regulatory conundrum in Canada. The regulator basically said the cable replacements are very expensive. So you know what, go find further proof. There is no proof. So the question is, what do we want to do? Because this issue will come and hit every utility around the world at some point especially the Asian utility, the African utilities, and the East Asian utilities. May not perhaps be the Northern utilities. And so it becomes a big problem. The second part of the problem is, if you look at the per kilometer cost of cabling, which is buried, it's got a particular specification, and you're supposed to put it five feet or six feet deep with a bedding of rock, then you put the cable, then you put slabs, then you put more crushed stone, and then you backfill. It costs far more sometimes than the cable itself that you put. And so the question, therefore, is, is there a better way, a cheaper way of, make, of laying cables? Why? Because in the east coast of India, we are actually replacing a lot of overhead lines with cables for climate proofing, which is one of the questions today that we have raised in this thing. So you can go line by line by line in, in what's given as the agenda, and you'll find that somebody in this audience here will be affected by something that is happening to their system. And the question ask, that I'm asking here is, is it to be, you know, is it fair to say is it serious? Or is it just perhaps not there? Right? And so with that, I'm going to ask each speaker to sort of open it up and then give me your views as to what you think this is. Or if you think this is not a big thing, then leave it at the way it is. So, so I think let's keep it as a dialogue. And this is, like I said, this is the second one of our dialogue, which we had one last year. And perhaps we should continue this because any time a standards organization puts a derating factor on paper, all the operators, asset owners, are essentially going to get you know, their assets stranded. You have a transformer that's rated for 100 MVA. They tell you it's only good for 90 MVA. Can you imagine? What do you do? You have just lost 10% of that ROA on that asset. And you, there's no way to recover that. So before we get caught with that question, the question, the question better is how do we handle it on a dynamic, real-time basis? if it can be handled. And if it can be handled, that's well and good. If it cannot be, then let's go back and then think of some other ways. So our first speaker today is going to be Michael Potter. He's going to be speaking online from California. And uh, so Michael, are you on? And can you, can you hear me OK? Yep, we can hear you now. Thank you. Yeah, the floor is yours. So um, what, what an honor to participate in this uh, forum. It's an incredibly uh, uh, relevant topic and uh, incredibly urgent. And I think, I think it's a worldwide challenge. Uh, 
you know, there, there are many places around the world where, you know, you see uh, representations of world-class infrastructure. Uh, how, how's the audio coming through? And there's uh, many, many places where there are uh, examples of world-class uh, infrastructure. But one, one of the challenges with infrastructure, both in developed and in developing countries, is that um, some of the infrastructure is very vulnerable to um, uh, natural disasters, to, uh, to, to combat, to warfare, to man-made uh, problems and challenge it and uh, one of the one of the things that we have seen uh, in North America and particularly the United States is a lot of the power grid is above ground and there's there's some reasons for this and uh, it's a complex uh, interplay of issues and these are challenges that um, remain around the world and it's interesting because if uh, if somebody is in a, an emerging country, there are probably things that they want to uh, emulate about um, the infrastructure in the developed world. And, you know, and that makes a lot of sense. But one of the things that people should be really careful about is not duplicating what doesn't work in the developed world. And in the case of the United States, and a lot of this is really a regulatory background and regulatory tradition is that the power companies have been monopolistic and are uh, run by uh, specific regulators. And so in many of the states, we have a public utilities commission that regulates the power companies. But you also have other monopolies that run alongside the power. You have oftentimes monopoly water, monopoly gas, monopoly sewage, and, um, and you also even have road monopolies, so that uh, the, the folks that build roads and then separately the people that build rail for trains are different monopolies that are uh, regulated generally by different regulatory bodies. And so in the case of a place like California, uh, the power companies and the road companies had 100 years to work together side by side. But the uh, road authorities, because they're monopoly, were pretty indifferent and um, uh, didn't feel like there was any reason to cooperate with uh, the other monopoly utility infrastructures. And this is really an issue about leadership or, or perhaps more accurately a lack of leadership. So really in, in the U.S. And, and, and I know that in uh, India you do have the strong state decentralized state structure as well. But uh, in the U.S. ultimately the governor uh, has the power, has the theoretical political power to force uh, people to work together, whether it's uh, uh, the various utility operators or whether it's uh, the case of the rail uh, operators or the case of the uh, roadworks authority and the problem is really about leadership lack of leadership and lack of incentives there's no incentive for people to work together so if you say hey we're going to save uh, our citizens and our ratepayers billions of dollars a year if we all work together most entities don't care it's not their problem that they, they don't have an incentive structure and oftentimes the political ruling class is, um, is um, cautious not to get in a fight with, um, you know, the large industrial operators of these monopoly services or, or maybe even the, um, the employee unions that go along with these large monopolistic entities. And so one of the challenges that you run into and you know, in, in, in California, it's, uh, it's wildfires. In many parts of the United States, it's things like hurricanes or tornadoes, uh, floods, uh, occasionally uh, tsunamis or uh, coastal erosion. But in the case of California in particular, because the utility companies were so stubborn and they demanded that they just do things the way they wanted to do it, 
they ended up running a lot of the power lines above ground through forests. And the challenge is when the wind kicks up, uh, then the power lines start to blow back and forth. And uh, eventually, you know, uh, branches can drop down on the power lines, or sometimes the power lines ends up, end up shorting out and the transformers end up blowing up. And when the transformers blow, you can then get um, uh, forest fires that are started. And, you know, one of the examples that uh, many people remember from just a few years back is that in one of the rural areas in a small town called Paradise, California, 90 people were murdered by this sort of activity. They were killed when uh, the winds picked up, the, uh, the electrical uh, lines shorted and transformers blew and wildfires uh, uh, ended up uh, being initiated. And the interesting thing about PG&E is one of the oldest and most storied of the power operators in the United States. They, um, they had gone bankrupt previously. So around 2000, they went bankrupt with the Enron debacle. And uh, there were a lot of damages and problems. Then they were, in a sense, reconstituted. And then with the uh, wildfires and the death of the 90 people and the billions and billions of dollars of damages, they went bankrupt again. And uh, this, this is all under the framework of an incredibly regulated monopoly, but a monopoly that's regulated in a silo and not comprehensively. And so, you know, and I, I just wanna kick off the discussion and, and, and maybe the debate, but you know, one of the challenges is not so, it's, there's a political challenge, there's a regulatory challenge, but you know, there's also engineering challenges, which is, you know, do all the tools properly exist to engineer the integrated infrastructure that the world needs? And, and you know, so it's, it's, it's an engineering challenge, it's a structural challenge, it's an incentive challenge, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's fundamentally a leadership challenge. And so, you know, these are, these are not problems that are unique to the United States, and these are not problems that are unique in the case of California or PG&E, but these are, these are global problems. And it, it's also very interesting that India has done some very interesting work, and I know that there was a pilot project in Bangalore which uh, really looked at, or actually implemented in a limited way, some integrated infrastructure. So actually reworking some of the, uh, the streets to create better tra uh, traffic, reworking the streets to allow a better parking, reworking the streets to allow street vendors to uh, more effectively sell their goods, but also uh, trying to uh, relocate and optimize some of the uh, infrastructure. So I think, you know, that, that to me is a step in the right direction. And, you know, hopefully a model of what can be done uh, in other countries around the world and, and in places like Latin America, Asia, and Africa, in some of these areas, it's a white canvas. You know, there's, there, there, the roads don't exist yet, uh, or the, you know, maybe there's dirt roads, but they're, they're, the roads uh, don't exist, and they're going to be added, and they'll be uh, expanded. And um, if we can create the right structures and the, and the right incentives, there's a hope that um, maybe we can create efficiencies so that um, we can uh, pull people out of poverty. And that's really... One of the most important things I'd say about infrastructure, oftentimes people look at infrastructure as boring and unexciting and uninspiring, but it's probably the single most important uh, 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 pursuit to pull people out of poverty is infrastructure. And so it's really important that we get it right, that we get the models right, that we have the tools, that we create the incentives, and then we, and then we can scale that globally. And that's really just kind of uh, the intervention that I wanted to make just wanted to um, you know, start off this morning by providing a, a, a perspective, maybe a perspective that's not 100% relevant for India,
but also a, a perspective that might be relevant in terms of inspiring some efficiency and um, really, and, and, and maybe inspiring engineers and, and hopefully policymakers on what might be possible uh, through leadership, cooperation, and reworking of incentives. So, so I really, once again, I appreciate allowing me the opportunity to present today and look forward to uh, you know, hearing my colleagues as they also talk about these issues. heard that there's 10,000 miles of undergrounding and cables in California alone that PG&E wants to execute. So there's this big program outlay. I was in, in the Bay Area three weeks ago, and I just heard that number. It threw me off. The 10,000 miles of cabling is what they want. So our next speaker will be, uh, by the way, Michael, are you planning to stay for the rest of the session as well? It's about 9 o'clock your time at night. Um, were you planning to? Okay, I probably can't hear us. I, I can hear every, every okay, good. few words. Good. <laughs> so you were planning to be with us, right, for the whole session? Or are you planning to retire for the night? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, if, if it's possible, it'd be great to get some, you know, if people wanted to do uh, question and answers, uh, you know, if people wanted to talk about it. But I would prefer to... Uh, to retire for the night because I have uh, another session for the Indian Smart Grid Forum uh, first thing in the morning <laughs> okay. in just a few hours. So is there a question for Michael? I think uh, he brings a great point together of working together, creating incentives, recognizing the problem, and that is an infrastructure issue that we all belong to. So is there a question that's in anybody's mind uh, that we can pose it right to him? And then if he decides to retire for the night, that's okay, we'll excuse him. Yeah, money. A question that I always look at any time people talk about incentives, I think that's a net zero game because there is nothing like free money. Any time we talk about incentives, somebody is paying for it, right? So let's take the state of California that I've done a lot of work at. And the question is that if I do incentives, a state that is already highly taxed, already uh, paying a lot of uh, a very, very high utility uh, rate, uh, is this kind of heading in the wrong direction? How do you convert this into something that a company like PG&D ought to be doing on their own versus providing incentives which then sends the wrong market signals? Michael, did you hear that? Yeah, the audio does not seem to be operating. Okay, the question I think, if I can repeat and paraphrase money is, he comes from a state just north of you, uh, and, and so the, the question is, with, always when we talk of joint and incentives, it means somebody's paying for it. It's free money in a way. So his view is, can PG&E do anything by itself? Just that it corrects this problem as opposed to more money being shoved into it, you know, for purpose of uh, giving incentives to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> again, you know, the audio is very, very difficult. Uh, I did hear that, you know, um, trying to correct the problem, and I heard about, you know, um, and maybe it's the di difficulty of correcting the problem and something about money, but other than that, I, I wasn't able to get, <laughs> unfortunately, get the, the full question. Okay, he's going to repeat the question on a different mic. Hopefully you can hear it. Or, yes, yes. Yeah, no, so, yeah, very good question, which is, um, and, you know, and that's also a, a problem, right? If the, sometimes when people have too much money, uh, that creates a whole bunch of other problems. And, and I actually think that's the existing situation, which is that uh, in some ways there's an embarrassment of riches and 
That's why nobody works together because there's enough money. It seems like there's enough money to go around. But, you know, uh, Charlie Munger, um, who is Warren Buffett's, uh, you know, right-hand man, he says, if you want to understand behavior, uh, study the incentives. And I think that's, and when I look at the problems with having um, fragmented infrastructure and not having integrated infrastructure and all the problems that go with having fragmented infrastructure, which the ratepayers have to pay a premium on every single one of the fragmented infrastructures. Uh, and then I wonder, well, why, well, why isn't this rational? Why, and, and part of it is because it wasn't engineered from day one to be rational. So, so everyone does kind of what they want and they do it in a different timeline. But, but I also think that there, there is no incentive to work together. And so, uh, and, so and, when, and, and when I talk about working together, I, I, want, I, I would argue to do that in terms of efficiency, both in terms of engineering efficiency and to save money and to ultimately save citizens' money and to save ratepayers' money. So, so it's, and, and so it's definitely, I would definitely not make the argument of throwing more money at these idiots because, you know, to build more crazy infrastructure that's vulnerable and is going to break and so forth. So it's what I'm trying, as what I would be making an argument for is, you know, how do you create the incentives to kind of unwind and to rationalize it? So I think that's the argument I'm trying to make. Any other question before Michael leaves? Anybody from the panel? Okay, uh, so tell Michael he's off the hook. He can, we'll see him a few hours from now. So thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll see you in a few hours in the other session. Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, I'll see you this evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So our next speaker is uh, Stefan Ten, Ten Bohelm, Bo, Bohelm, sorry for my pronunciation, from the University of Stuttgart. I also see you're from High Voltage Engineering, so we'll learn a lot from your talk. Thank you. Yeah, I know that with my name there, I have several people problems. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can I have the presentation? Yeah, I would like to start with a quite general thing. So if you have electrical equipment and it is loaded, um, then of course the load creates losses. And these losses increase the increase the, um, the temperature of the equipment. And um, the equipment itself, it's cooled by the ambient. So what is the limit for the loading? A certain temperature should not be exceeded for the equipment. So this can happen if the load is too high or if the ambient temperature, the cooling temperature, is too high. Yeah, so there are both factors which can limit the operation of the equipment. And currently, we have both situations. Load is changing due to renewables, so we have a quite strong change in loading. And secondly, due to climate change, we have a change in ambient temperature. Therefore, the situation is not so predictable, predictable anymore for the equipment. We investigated this today um, in case of wind farm transformers. On this picture, you can see such a wind farm transformer, um, which is used to bring the electrical energy generated by um, the wind generator to the electrical grid. And the wind, of course, has an unsteady character, and so the output of a wind farm um, often results in peak loading of the feeding wind farm transformer. 
even sometimes these transformers can be overloaded. So the objective is to estimate a non-critical overload dependent on the ambient temperature, which means in wintertime, maybe, when we have strong winds, we can overload the transformer due to the lower ambient temperature. In summertime, when it's hot, and when we do not have maybe not so much wind, um, we have no problems with the loading. But of course, for this purpose, we need a thermal model of the transformers in order to predict its temperature. And so the task was here to develop an, um, a simple thermal model for use in an online monitoring system to um, display the thermal operating state sufficiently. I was asked to keep it short this morning, therefore I want to keep, of course, it short the description of the model. The thermal model is according to an IEC standard. Um, this um, is a part of the power transformer standard. Um, you can see here the formula. I will not explain the formula, um, but it's basically um, dependent on three values. One is, as I mentioned, the load factor the ambient temperature, and the top oil temperature. Yeah, so with this formula, you can calculate the change of the top oil temperature dependent on load factor and ambient temperature. You need also two constant parameters, um, K1 um, and um, theta um, of the oil temperature, um, the, the time constant of the oil temperature, um, these parameters are fitted by measured values. So we have here this wind transform farm transformer, which is equipped with temperature sensors. And in the graphs, you can see what we have measured there. Let's say first the, the middle curve. The middle curve here is the um, loading curve of the transformer. So in this case, the transformer was loaded up to 70%. Um, um, we have then the, in, in red, the top oil temperature, and additionally, for this case, we had also the hotspot temperature um, measured with this transformer. And um, we used these values to parameterize that thermal model. And um, by this thermal model, you can now calculate the top oil temperature dependent on ambient temperature and load. And um, in the um, lower graph, you can see the error we are doing you, with, with such a calculation. And the error is quite small. So now we can describe the thermal behavior of the, of the um, transformer quite well. And now we use this for estimating the long-term overload. You know, the um, load of the transformer is restricted by the maximum oil temperature and the maximum hotspot temperature. And if we assume that we allow a hotspot temperature of 120 degrees Celsius, now we can calculate the maximum load dependent on the ambient temperature. And this is shown in the graph, yeah, so you can see here on the x-axis the ambient temperature and um, the overload capacity. So at 40 degrees ambient temperature, this specific transformer can be overloaded by 15%, so um, overload capacity is 115%. But if we go for an ambient temperature of zero degrees, which is in Germany um, often happening during winter time, we have an overload capacity of 140%. So we can overload this transformer. Maybe if we want to look from the Indian point of view, yeah, we do not have to look for zero degrees ambient temperature. Maybe we have to look for 40 or 50 degrees um, temperature in summertime. Then you can see that the loading capacity, of course, is reduced. This curve is valid for this specific transformer. 
Yeah, um, it depends, of course, on the design of the cooling system, and, um, 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 but we check this design by parameterizing of this thermal model. So some of the utilities implemented these algorithms in their control system in order to use um, overload um, capacity of the transformers. But to do this, of course, it is important to look for the reliability of the power transformers. Yeah, um, I'm uh, chairing a working group, a Seeger working group, which analyzes um, the um, failure rates of power transformers worldwide. This is um, one example of the results. So we have here the failure rates in different voltage classes for different applications of transformers. Maybe the most important are the blue bars because these are the transmission substation transformers. And you can see here that we have here, let's say, an average failure rate of 0.5% per year. And if you have such a low failure rate, um, it shows that um, the design of your transformers, the maintenance, and also the operation is in good condition. And then you can do these overload regimes. But we had also um, um, information that, for example, in the distribution sector of transformers, the failure rate can be much higher. I heard here from India that there are levels of 10% per year of failure rates. And of course, in this case, you cannot use such overload regimes because this would increase furthermore the failure rate. Um, therefore, I um, was invited by the GIZ um, to investigate the failure behavior of these um, distribution transformers in India. And maybe during the coffee break also we can talk to each other if you have some experience regarding failures of, of distribution transformers, what could be the reason and how the situation can be improved. Thank you for your attention. Presentation. So, so Ravi, you asked when you started our session, you asked, is this topic meaningful and, and should we continue? So, um, you know, I've spent about 22 years of my career uh, working for a company called Electric Power Research Institute uh, before I joined LNT last year. And this is one topic we have always neglected because whenever we try to do the planning and reliability analysis and, and, and assessment, we fail to realize that because of climate change and temperature variations, the capability of transformers or lines to handle that weather changes is changing. And, and, and you know, I don't know if any one of you guys are in, from Texas, so we have talked about California today, so I'm going to go to another state, uh, which is Texas, uh, Austin. This year, they had a severe uh, snow event in, in the end of January, and they say that the largest restoration operation in over 127 years of history in Austin Energy. Now, um, what caused this? So at the peak of this storm, it caused nearly 174,000 customers to lose power at one time. So that is 32% of the customer base. So the outage spread over an entire territory of 437 square miles, and it took almost a week to restore. First, the electricity was out. When the electricity came, came back, the water went out. Now, why did this happen? So one of the common reasons, and, and you know, um, the CEO of Austin Energy is in deep pressure. Um, so so they, have, uh, they have started this investigation, and, and they are saying that the city has 2,400 miles of primary overhead lines today, about 14 miles of secondary, and 20 miles of street light. So, so Mani and Ravi mentioned about undergrounding. 2,400 miles of undergrounding is a lot of money. Who pays for it? The people who reside in Austin Energy. 
So there has to be understanding of not only just undergrounding, but also the equipment. You know, Stephen, you, you mentioned on that. And you have to look at it not from an operation standpoint. You have to look at it from a planning standpoint. And I think that is the gap even in EPRI when, you know, when I was in EPRI. This has been become a number one topic that was selected by the board for further investigation. And, and to make things complicated, there is multiple tools you will need because it's not a static model anymore. So you cannot just run Plexos, uh, you know, integrated resource planning or a PSSE model, which is a snapshot. You have to run dynamics, you know, probabilistic analysis. So, so with that, I will... Now, how do I move my slides? Okay. Um, so what is showing up is, is, is different, guys, um, on this laptop is what is showing. What is showing here is correct. So, um, so the climate impacts and community resilience, resilience on planning is actually is governed by a couple of different parameters. The physical climate variables. Ravi, you mentioned about some of those. Um, the energy system relevance. The situation awareness, you know, even though there is, you know, quite a bit of that example I gave on Texas, 2,400 miles um, within, within their service territory that is overhead. Now, they're not going to make everything overhead or underground in a few months. It will take a transition. So understanding the situation awareness, both from a planning standpoint and operation standpoint, is, is very important. And then this whole siloed attention in how do I take the equipment withstanding capabilities when, when I'm assuming that these systems will be available during these weather conditions requires a whole new set of understanding and tools. And then, you know, from an operational planning standpoint, Ravi mentioned this, you cannot work with static models anymore. You have to have the risk, risk assessment, which is either probabilistic or some other uh, way but not, not, uh, not, an, you know, not static analysis anymore. The other thing, and then I'm going to talk about a project that uh, LNT has been awarded uh, in partnership with EPRI and others, is whenever an operator today, and, and, I think, and I think this is all over the world, Ravi, whenever there is a storm, the operator sits in their control room, it looks at situation awareness, of the equipments that are damaged. It looks, gets information from whether they have an outage management system or whether they have a real way to get information of where the outages are and what the crews are reporting. And it also has information of what the critical facilities are in their service territory. These three only information. And then it makes a decision to do a switching order and bring some of these lines over time. What it does not have is all the millions of behind the meter, solar and battery, front of the meter, behind the meter, it doesn't have a way to include those when it is making operational decisions and, and bringing up these lines. This is another huge area that will have a fundamental shift as we move forward. So recently, as, as part of Department of Energy is, is, is putting in a lot of dollars on infrastructure planning. So and I, as part of this process, you know, we are, um, we are building this up where we, we want to understand the community engagement. We want to understand the community needs and resources. We want to understand the overall DER presence. We, un we want to understand, you know, the availability of equipment and their lifetime, and then the community exchange plan and overall framework for this resilience planning is, is a tool that we have proposed to Department of Energy. And in this team, we have partnership with Electric Power Research Institute, Nashville Electric in Tennessee. We also have PGE. Uh, which you don't see here, 
but we have a Solano County and City of Fairfield as part of this team. So what we are saying is, you need, as part of the operational planning, you need to look at it from not only just from the top down, which is what utilities have been doing as of today, but also from a bottoms up. So when the operators are trying to make these decisions, they will have a much informed way to, to, to identify what the situation awareness is and then develop their switching orders based on options along the grid that are viable. Now, this example also in Nashville, Ravi, that happened, where they thought that some of these, like that example that you mentioned, the transformers and some of the lines, they felt, they thought that they could withstand that cold weather. But they could not, because of their aging. Those assets were 40 years old. So had they listened to what Stephen is talking about, you know, then they would have realized that during that storm that happened this year, they would have lost those sections of the line which they did not even take into consideration. So, so this is one of the reasons why what we propose, so what we proposed is a planning tool. And with Nashville and PG&E, we would like to integrate their, this planning tool as part of ADMS. So that's the purpose of this project. And another important thing, there's a lot of stuff here, um, but the, again, the most important thing, as I said, as of now, resilience planning at and control room and operator's desk has been all utility facing. What is going to happen as part of these projects, and we are going to probably engage a lot more utilities you know, as we move forward, we are going to develop in LNT, we will develop these this dashboard, visualization dashboard, that will give you information of various elements that will help you make decision, you meaning the operator, make decision of what system is feasible and what is not feasible. Because as I mentioned to the example of Austin Energy, it is in fact true that it took two weeks for them to fully cover, recover back. That in any utility setting is unacceptable. Because if you ask Ravi, you know, from Hydro One, every utility has a reliability goal and matrix. Seifi, Seidi, Meifi. If you exceed that, you have to pay humongous penalty. So Austin Energy quadrupled the, the time that they were supposed to meet for, for their state by that factor. So I'm 100% I'm sure that soon their CEO is going to get fired. The point I want to make, and I, I know my time's up, this is a very serious topic. And, and this requires not only intervention of re uh, regulation, but this is why planning and operation has to work hand in hand because there is a lot of things that are, that are needed in some of these tool development as well that has to be evolved and developed. So this project is, is something we are starting off this year. Uh, again, as I said, this is part of Biden administration bipartisan um, infrastructure law bill, BIL bill. Um, there's a huge amount of money that will get spent on, on this grid resilience. This is just a beginning. But what we want to do is, as a next step, we want to put this and operationalize that with multiple utilities in the ADMS. So that's the intention. With that, let me stop. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Fazan, founder of Tensor Dynamics, and we are a climate data tech startup. Uh, I wouldn't talk about my startup, but the problem we focus on is quite relatable to what uh, our uh, panel has discussed uh, till now uh, on the infrastructure side, on the operational issues, on the load side, uh, I'm going to touch points where uh, how weather and climate dynamics affects and on what scale to the whole infrastructure of grid and uh, how we can plan like uh, just Mr. Uh, Mr. Metra, uh, he was talking about how we need specialized planning tools. 
to solve this problem and create resilience uh, in this whole infrastructure, we also need a lot of data behind it and uh, a lot of climate data too. That is the, our point of uh, discussion, my point of discussion right now. Can we pull up uh, my presentation? Please? Okay, the, because of some issue, the presentation is not available. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, discuss uh, with a dialogue. So uh, there is a lot of weather dynamics. A lot of weather processes happens on different scales, be it thunderstorms, be it hurricanes, uh, be it cyclones. And on a larger scale, uh, we see processes like monsoon, El Nino, La Nina. All these uh, processes have uh, certain effects on different parts of our grids. Uh, on the generational side, we have wind and solar, which is directly affected by these processes. Uh, on the operational side, we have the transmission, the grid infrastructure, the transformer, the transmission lines, and these are majorly affected. Uh, as the, our speakers just discussed, that how uh, the temperature change, in ambient temperature change, can affect the aging of transformers. Uh, on the last other side of it, on the user side of it, you respond, the users respond to change in these processes. It, the change in ambient temperature, if there is a sudden rain, if there is a sudden thunderstorm, uh, suddenly the load fluctuates. How we are utilizing the energy fluctuates. So all the three parts of uh, our infrastructure is uh, being heavily uh, being heavily deflected by these, heavily deviated uh, by these processes. So uh, we need a lot of weather data, a lot of training to uh, be able to predict these. See, uh, the only uh, thing we can do is uh, predict and plan accordingly, right? We cannot stop nature from happening. We cannot stop these processes. We have to plan ourselves. And to plan ourselves, we need to know uh, the dynamics of nature and plan ahead of it. So, uh, to touch the topic how regulations uh, behave on these points, uh, there is a regulation by CERC, uh, Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, that is called Deviation and Settlement Mechanism. So what, what it uh, does, it tells a power plant, be it solar or wind power plant, it tells the power plant that you have to uh, schedule your power into the power grid a day before. You have to tell how much power a power plant is going to generate. Okay, And uh, in real time, you can update according to what are the weather events happening. And uh, upon, these, uh, reg uh, upon these schedules, if your schedule is not matched uh, with what you have uh, forecasted and scheduled into the power grid, uh, there is huge penalties, uh, like Mr. Stephen also touched this point, there are penalties on these uh, points. Uh, there are huge penalties that goes in thousands of crores right now in India with only 100 gigawatt of solar. So this is again a major issue because ultimately someone is paying for it, right? Uh, the coal power plants have to ramp up suddenly, uh, work in very low efficiency to match up the fluctuation in renewables. And ultimately, renewables pay for it uh, in terms of penalty in thousands of crores. So why all this is happening? There is uh, fluctuation on the grid side too. And we are still not able to plan it properly. Uh, there are huge price changes on a spot market, on uh, price market, because of this real-time fluctuations. So we need really good weather forecasting data. Uh, our company focuses on providing these weather forecast data uh, using all the advanced technologies that are available to uh, the generation companies, to the transmission companies, to uh, the companies which uh, dictates load, like load dispatch centers, discoms, so that they can plan ahead and uh, create correlations. So uh, Mr. Arindam was talking about uh, how a grid operator deviates the load 
how uh, they change the load in the uh, power grid if they say, uh, see a storm coming, right? Uh, if they see a storm coming, they have just a dashboard uh, where they see the storm coming and they see, okay, this area is going to affect, so they have to decrease the load accordingly. But if they get point by point data before time, that how much load is going to uh, get decreased, how much effect that weather process is going to have in next three hours, in next six hours, so that you can plan in terms of data. Uh, that is what we want to enable in the industry. And uh, it requires a lot of different kind of uh, weather forecasting services, not just uh, uh, we see weather forecasting as just one service, right? Uh, we see weather forecasting as a whole. It's not as a whole. Uh, there are a lot of components going on, playing at different parts uh, of uh, our uh, power grid, our infrastructure, generation, uh, the demand side. So uh, I would like, uh, like to touch four points of uh, how weather forecasting affects different parts of grid. Okay. So first of all, we have uh, real-time markets where real-time fluctuations happen, a process is coming, that effect of process uh, on power grid is very uh, real-time and very uh, sustained uh, in terms of uh, the potential of it. So from 0 to 6 hour, where uh, these processes are happening and the intensity is very high, you have to predict it with very high accuracy. Right? And this helps in accurate uh, uh, scheduling of power, be it uh, renewables, solar and wind, you have to accurately schedule how much uh, load it is going to uh, dispatch, how much power it is going to generate, how much the power is going to deviate. Uh, you have to calculate all these to be able to say, okay, this much effect is going to have uh, on my power plant. If there is a cyclone on uh, Bay of Bengal, there is a power plant on Andhra Pradesh, uh, there is going to be some effect for uh, a few hours. So you have to calculate accurately to be able to utilize this power into the grid. The grid can cannot fluctuate uh, so much and it has to be stabilized. Now, uh, if we talk about day ahead and week ahead uh, forecast, whether how it affects uh, our planning and scheduling, you have to have unit commitments that how much power you are going to give to which discom, how much power you are going to sell on the open market, how much power you are going to uh, give to a particular state, a particular city. You have to have all these numbers and have bids for it in a spot market. If you are uh, not providing, being not able to provide these numbers, and in terms of wind and solar, these numbers are directly related to weather, right? So you have to have a week ahead forecast prepared with you so that you can uh, be prepared for your unit commitment. You can be prepared for this uh, planning and operations. Now, there comes seasonal forecast up to a year ahead where we have to forecast seasons accurately and how the global processes are going to affect a particular area where your power plant is. Uh, you have to accurately predict so that you can uh, calculate your revenues, you can project your uh, overall uh, rate of uh, return, you can commit this power into the power grid. The power grid asks you to commit this power at least a month or six months before and if uh, a season, let's say even monsoon, is coming a little stronger, a little before, your commitment is going to defy and you have to be ahead of it, you have to provide your commitment with a lot of analytics, with a lot of data and you, that's where you need a year ahead uh, weather forecast, seasonal forecast, how the seasons are going to affect your power plant in terms of numbers I'm saying. All this has to be brought down into numbers. Uh, now, there is uh, a 25 year to 30 year ahead forecast. We call it climate forecast, right? Climate projection. Climate projections are necessary when we are doing such discussions of planning uh, how the grid should operate and how we should create infrastructure. Because while creating infrastructure, we have to keep one thing in mind that the climate is changing and it is not going to be the same as it is now because uh, the problem is started uh, only there that we have uh, ignored this problem of climate change and the infrastructure uh, crea was created 20 years ago. Right now the climate is different. 
and it is going to change. So we have to keep that change in mind. We have to project those changes into our uh, infrastructure planning. While uh, whether we are planning a smart grid, whether we are planning a power plant, be it wind, solar, whether we are planning how the load capacity is going to be, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, that there is climate change and how much effect these changes are going to have on your infrastructure. You have to have this planning uh, before. And that's where you need even a 30 year ahead. So the horizons uh, are huge. The temporal horizon and the spectral horizon of uh, weather forecasting and its effect on the grid is huge. So starting from zero to six hours, from six hours to up to a week, from uh, a week to up to a year ahead, then a year ahead to 25 year ahead, uh, you need all these information with you uh, to be able to do uh, the grid modernization that we want to look forward. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess first we'll open it up to questions and then I have a few comments or of just to get the discussion going, if at all. Yes, Admiral. Uh, once again, uh, I'm Admiral A.K. Saxena. I would like to, uh, you know, give you a small understanding of a microgrid on board a ship. And I want to correlate that what Ravi talked about, uh, whether this problem is real or imaginary, whether it should be tackled or not, uh, I would try to correlate that along with uh, the type of technologies that can be used or what are the options available. Uh, just to, uh, for a brief understanding of a ship, uh, warship uh, design, a few hundred to uh, tens of hundreds of kilometers of cables are there on board a ship, a warship, in a length of, largest length of about 300 meters by about 40, 45 meters width of a ship divided in several uh, decks. These cables are actually uh, going in bunches. And uh, despite the fact that the ship uh, has a temperature of ambient temperature of about 18 degrees, because of these cables being inside bunches, uh, the temperature, uh, the, the heat dissipation is a big issue. So it's a stimulated uh, high temperature environment in which we operate. Having said that, the biggest design for, uh, biggest challenge for our uh, designers is uh, uh, how to size the cables. So the easiest method is that we size the cables based on the current carrying capacity. But here the situation is the temperatures are likely to go very high. So what we used to do in our earlier days was to over design the cable by two sizes upward. And those days we used to use uh, the uh, you know, PVC and polyurethane cross-linked cables, chemically cross-linked cables. Uh, subsequently, we realized that there are better technologies of cross-linking. In fact, this is where when the, when we, when the cable is extruded and the insulation is extruded, uh, the method that we uh, learned subsequently was uh, electronic, electron beam cross-linking of cables. And we realized that the temperature handling capacity of those insulators is far superior than the chemically cross-linked, conventionally chemically cross-linked cables. So this is how we reduce the, uh, you know, sizes of the cable and hence the weight of, uh, weight carrying, uh, weight of these cables on board the ship. Uh, so my view is that the problem that Mr. Ravi has brought out is real. It has to be tackled, but is over design the only option? Or as uh, Arindam mentioned, or I think uh, uh, Stephen mentioned about uh, use of advanced technologies, better cooling systems, uh, whether we should go in for that, or it should be a combination of these uh, that we need to look at, which will ultimately give us a solution in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Actually, it was a discussion in Bhubaneswar 
He's an inspiration, by the way. We all talk of microgrid and we hum and haw what we have done. Just imagine a battleship in the middle of nowhere. It has all the reliabilities that you can count on it. A submarine that's parked somewhere in the middle of an ocean. There is no grid to come and stabilize it because you got into trouble. So it was amazing in exchanging, you know, talk. I must have kept him for almost an hour or so in Bhuvaneshwar discussing this issue. And the ultimate of ultimate microgrid design actually comes from the design of these warships. So thank you, Admiral. Any other questions? So let me then pose my few comments and observations, and maybe we'll get a discussion going in the last 15 minutes. So very quickly, there were three or four that I captured from here. One is the notion of being able to get the environmental data more accurate. And we did that. In fact, at one time in my utility career, we normally map 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers square is a weather map. We tried to take it to a meso scale, 2.5 by 2.5, using the IBM Watson computer. This was like five, six years ago. What we found is the amount of data that it generates and the amount of horsepower you need to get those meso scale data was simply overwhelming. So that's not to say fast forward now in five, six years, or fast forward in another five years to come, that this will not be. But the weather data and companies that take weather data and give you better models should think along the lines of what's called mesoscale. I sit on the ACG committee of the IEC, where we are discussing all the critical components in the electricity infrastructure for climate change, which includes floods. So in case of floods, for example, our 100-year-old maps are all becoming obsolete. We now have to go for a 200-year-old map to see where to locate our substation. We don't have 200-year maps in most cities. So the question is, what do we do with the stuff that we have? In New Orleans, for example, all the homes are like seven feet high. All the homes that got damaged by the floods, basically they just raise them up on the stilts and they're like seven, eight feet high. So when you come to the home, you'll actually have to climb a ramp of stairs. You can't do that for substations, or should we do that for substations? Is, is on the floodplain side, right? And, and Pakistan had a big flood. I'm not sure what they have done, but I have to ask a few of my colleagues uh, and friends that I have there. The second is the whole, a is, is, is that of basically, the customer does something, in, and this was intuitively I was picking up from his discussion. You know, when, the, when we have bad climate change, we look at how to lower the loading from a utility perspective. But the customer in many ways is actually increasing the load at the same time. So hot temperature comes up, we say, oh my God, you know, how do I keep this transformer cool? How do I lower the load? All that kind of stuff. Whereas they're saying, crank that air conditioner. And so we have this opposite effect that's taking place. And I'm not sure whether that's working against one another or what is one rationalization? Maybe in your model, you have to bring that behind the meter uh, kind of thing, right? The last is, in fact, very important. I think uh, the question, and, and me in Canada have done this, by the way, uh, we've, for the last four years we've worked on it, is, is the hot oil temperature the real measurement for a transformer? Uh, we know that several paper insulations is 90 degrees, the hot oil temperature is 120 degrees. And our view in Canada has been that because it's so difficult to keep on measuring with RTDs and others, it's such an intrusive way of measuring temperature, we basically gave it up and said, let's use I square RT for our hotspot temperature. So today we, in fact, look at temperatures by computations from the electrical side rather than physically measuring the temperature because it's so complex to measure. So we put our minds together about four or five years ago, and today we have a fiber optic temperature that we have done seven experiments with, and it seems to be working. One is we have actually wound the fiber on the co coil of the transformer, and we are now able to get a 3D model every meter within the, the transformer winding itself to say, do we have hot spots that we do not know? Is the top oil temperature really the true measure, or was it just a convenient measure that we had all these years? And so we actually found that there are many other parts of the transformer that gets hotter far quicker, core, close to the core steel, than it gets by the time it gets to the hot oil temperature. The second is on cables. I mentioned the 90 degree cable. You would take that temperature of the conductor to about 102, 103, and you've lost 30% of the cable life. And so that's how punitive it is. And, and so that is one, we have put it across electrical utilities in America. Ameren uses it. 
Uh, we've got several across Canada that we have done tests with. And so we are reasonably confident that we have to measure temperature in dynamic model to be able to actually say, okay, what, what should be our assumption at t is equal to zero, t is equal to t plus, and then what do we do at t is equal to plus, plus, plus. Otherwise, short of that, you're not going to get it. We also bound it actually on a high voltage motor on the windings because it's such a fiber. Fiber is nothing but a hair strand. So you're able to easily wind it, not easily, but you're able to wind it. Uh, you know, and, and get that. The last is what we have worked out, and very recently with one of the OEMs, is how do we measure hotspots for battery? You know, battery has got cells, it's got packs, it's got modules, it's got then the whole thing. And we see a lot of fires all around the world, whether it's for electric mobility, whether it is for stationary application, two-wheeler, three-wheeler. There is no part of the world that has never had a battery catch fire or not catch fire. And so we have that. So we are working, in fact, to see whether we should be able to develop some kind of a 3D model as to what actually happens in the hotspots as you basically operate these devices in its capacity or close to near capacity. So it could very well be that some of our theoretical modeling, which uh, we have been doing so far, is perhaps not all that correct. You know, it, it requires some kind of a uh, thing. So with, with those three or four observations, I'm going to first Turn to you, Professor. Uh, in a transformer you mentioned, uh, do you see this as a problem for larger transformers? Because th they are the ones where we cannot change them very quickly. In my utility days, if a big transformer went, it would take me weeks before I got a replacement. Whereas the smaller DTRs, which you explained in your uh, thing, uh, perhaps I can have an inventory of that, you know, and, and, and I can re change it out within a 24-hour period. What are your views on the larger station equipment which could be exposed to this weather temperatures? There, there, there are different applications of such a system. If you start from the big transformers, um, you know if you have a transmission system, the transformer has to be operated according to the N minus one criterion, which means if one fails, the transformer in parallel can take the load. And um, so let's say both have to be loaded maximum 50%. And nowadays, German utilities use the nominal values, so which you can see on the nameplate. And because of that, we have to do um, the, 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 the switching on of different power stations we have to change. So there is redispatch sometimes necessary, which means you cannot use a power station which is in the north of the country simply because the transmission capacity is not sufficient, so you have to switch on a power station in the south which is much more expensive. But if you would consider a higher loading of the transformer, this um, the, um, the power station in the north can be used, which is cheaper. Yeah? And therefore, such a tool can help to improve the operation of your power stations. Um, so it is necessary for these big transformers. For the smaller ones, um, one, let's say, current application is electrical vehicles. Because um, if, um, the, if, if, a, if a lot of people are using electrical vehicles and they want to load them, the um, power they need is much more as, let's say, the normal household consumption is. And normally, the small distribution transformers are not de designed for this new load. And it's often also not possible to exchange such a transformer. Although you can buy them quite fastly, but there is simply not enough space in the urban environment to install these bigger ones. So the idea is to use such a thermal monitoring for these small transformers in order to say, okay, now we can, use, we can load more electrical vehicles with this transformer and there is no need to exchange this transformer, although it's smaller, it's, it's, it's not so expensive, yeah? So technically it would be possible to, to, to change, but there are simply space restrictions, yeah? So it's difficult to say it's good for, for big or small transformers, 
but you have to see the full situation of such a transformer. Thanks. On your curve, I was a little interested. For countries like India, South Asia, Southeast Asia, if you were to move the axis at 40 degrees centigrade and push it to 55, 56, 60 degrees, you think your curve will still be linear relatively or would it suddenly become very non-linear? This is, a, in fact, a good question. Is this curve a curve or is it um, linear? Yeah, so it will drop stronger, I'm pretty sure. But you cannot extrapolate this curve of this German wind farm transformer to an Indian transformer because there the thermal design could be different. Yeah? This has to be checked. Yeah, so I cannot guess what is the situation at 50 degrees Celsius from this German wind farm transformer for an Indian distribution transformer. That's impossible. Yeah, so we have to investigate that. Thanks. Arindam, a question for you. What do you see in the discussions we have had where you mentioned beyond the meter, you know, looking at the assets of the customer to be able to take that into account for all the other mitigative measures? How far, how intrusive is this reach going to be, you think? So you're talking about behind the meter, right? Behind the meter asset. So, so there are projects right now, and, and, and this is the project also that we are doing, where utilities are wanting to have information of the behind the meter assets. This, this journey has already started with smaller, smaller utilities, like SMART. SMART has information of every behind the meter, solar and storage, you know, in their Pi historian. Now, the, uh, the three IOUs in California don't. Um, but if there is an incentive, so, so to this example for resilience, if there is an incentive to the customer, so let's say I have solar and battery in my home, right? I have an outage. I'm not part of the line which has a hospital and, and, and police station. So I'm literally out. But because of the incentive, utility is providing a pathway, that switching order, for them to utilize my solar to charge another battery on the feeder. We are going to do this in this project. We actually did that in another project. And in fact, we were supposed to do the demonstration at Austin Energy, you know, in our third year. And, and for some reason, they felt that this will create a risk to their customers. So they wanted to kind of remove all the non-critical customers out but Austin Energy came back and, and said, because of what happened this year, they said they would like to investigate. So I think, Ravi, this is going to happen. Whether this information is going to be directly tied to the utility ADMS directly, or it is coming from an aggregator, one way or the other, this information is needed and, and implement a new like TOU or, or incentive for resilience. So just one level below, I'm going to, you know, we use fee-based meters in North America. So if you can put caller after caller after caller, you can take battery, separate uh, variable, uh, solar, rooftop solar, separate variable, home consumption, and you can actually send four different variables to the utility. But in South Asia, parts of Europe, they don't use our fee-based meters. They use the, you know, the NL type of meters, if you will which means they have to now start putting new meters for every new area. So, so that's a problem. And that's a problem, right? And so something we need to think. What we solve in one part does not become a solution in another part of the world. So it, it does become a challenge. And, and, you know, there you, like, for example, you know, what I'm talking about is doing load management down to the customer. Maybe in India we don't have to do it that way. Maybe we still stay on the lateral level and do our sectionalizing there rather than down to the customer. You know, so those are the things that will govern. Because the reason why we thought about this approach, because load management you can do with demand response, you can do through AMI meter, you can do at the distribution transformer level, and you can do that, number four, is at the feeder sectionalizing in US. Now, a lot of utilities whom we are working with has the, 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 the reclosers down to that level, but a lot of them don't. So for those guys, we kind of will be stuck either at the distribution transformer level. But in India, maybe it is a stream up. But we are still getting to the point of implementing this load shedding rather than like what Austin Energy did between the last year's storm and this year's storm. 
they literally, like whenever there was an outage, they literally came up with a decision to improve reliability. They would have stages of, of shutting down the customers and then bringing back so that their restoration time does not look that bad. <laughs> Guess what happened? Mother Earth went opposite to them. It was the worst, as I said, of the 125 years because that scheme backfired because they never could bring them back up and whenever they did, the water, water got down. Thank you. La last uh, question. You know, when Faizan, I was looking, uh, hearing you, you know, one is this data aspect of better predictions. But you also have to ta provide a tangibleness, right? For us, firm power is what is required for dispatchability. Uh, and it's my view, right or wrong, that as we move beyond 30, 40, 50% firm dispatchability on renewable, the quantum of data required to process that much of AI to get your accuracy even higher will be like seven, eight times that. So in other words, where are you going to get all these data centers and AI mechanisms to be able to operate? And who do you think will have that level of you know, data store to be able to crunch the type of stuff you guys do? Okay, so the question is about uh, being able to uh, have that kind of data and that operational, that computational capacity, right? And uh, if you'll see, the computational capacity uh, right now with cloud computers is very high. Uh, you don't need to create your own infrastructure. You can access that infrastructure and leverage it to the point you want to. So even like you were just talking about 2.5 kilometer grid scale, you wanted to use a 2.5 kilometer uh, measure scale model uh, from IBM, but the computational cost was very high. And I'll tell you without uh, not too much high computation, there is computation uh, involved. Uh, we are able to run these models at 500 meters. Uh, our normal model works at three, and three kilometers. And uh, our highest uh, resolution model goes up to 12 and a half kilometers. So uh, we are able to uh, go below a kilometer, like uh, 500 meters, I, as I just said, where you can locate a power plant and be precise at it. Now, talking about the overall uh, quantum of it, when there is a lot of power plants inside a country and you have to calculate all these numbers uh, simultaneously and you need it quick. Uh, in terms of weather forecasting, uh, it is uh, actually a benefit because uh, the whole region is affected and you are not looking at a single point. You are looking at the whole Southeast Asia or even the whole globe. When you are simulating weather, you are simulating the whole globe. You are not simulating just one point. That one point will tell you the effect at your power plant. But you are simulating the whole globe, so you have that data. You, the more uh, area you will involve, the better forecasting you'll get. Okay. Uh, the reason I came to Mesoscale was when I was head of operations, we had a huge storm. A 500 kV station in one part was flooded. The, and three kilometers away was another 500 kV station and it was bone dry. So the first question my president asked is, could you not decide between the two which one you would keep, right? And I said, we do 10 square kilometers at, at one time. So we chose the 2.5 square kilometers, this was back in 2012, 2014, uh, to be able to say, you know, which stations to save and which stations you should shut down because of the way the weather patterns come. And today, in fact, in North America, we have proven again and again and again, you know, it comes in a very local level, pours and pours, you know, whether it's wind, whether it's water, whatever, and then it leaves the other part relatively untouched. So I think we still need to go down into that smaller mesoscale kind of a weather model to be able, for operation purposes, may not be for climate change. So I'm going to ask a last question to each one of you. And this is only for South Asia. And I think there's a benefit in the West that we have from colder temperatures. What do you think is going to be the nominal ambient temperature that standards should have in India? And what do you think is likely to happen, say, 10 years from now? For the, for the standard temperature, ambient temperature. It's right now 40 degrees, I told you, with a caveat. It should be 30 degrees for the last 24 hours before that. So effectively, it's a fudge on, it's not 40, 40, it is actually 30. But given where we are with Delhi at 49 and some parts of India at 55, uh, you know, what do you think should be the new standard 
uh, for our future standards going forward. So I'll begin with you, Faisal. Yeah. Uh, so what essentially you are talking about, uh, if we are looking at a city, we won't be able to say what, what would be the average ambient temperature. Uh, in Delhi, if we see the maximum temperature goes up to 48, uh, the minimum goes up to zero. So that's a huge dynamics. But if we talk about a whole region, if you are talking about Southeast Asia, the average ambient temperature goes up to 22, 23 degrees Celsius if you average it out. and. Uh, uh, in next 10 years, there's going to be at least a one and a half degree change in this, on the upper side. Uh, if you look at the uh, climate change projections, uh, in business as usual scenario as we are doing, we are trying to change it. Uh, there will be eight degrees change by the end of 2100. And we are trying to curb it to 4.5 degrees change. That's the best case we can get up to. So in next 10 years, uh, the effect is not going to be very high of all these infrastructure and renewables, and we are going to see a change of at least one and a half degrees. Yeah, I, I really hope it's one and a half because <laughs> many of us think not. Yes. Uh, and, and, and the reason I, I bring this up is when you talk of 48 degrees in the summer, actually you want to look at a night in the summer in Delhi, which is probably 30, 32, 31, right? So you're not getting a relief at night. Uh, the winter is a different scenario, so I'm not talking about 24, uh, you know, 365 days. I'm looking at maybe a week, you know, hot, hot temperatures. And this issue for us to manage on a week-by-week -week basis or 24-hour basis is how we get past the problem. Because in the rest of the season, we are able to manage with that same set of asset, the way Professor mentioned here. So the key question is, at any given time, you have to manage those three, four weeks or maybe 10 weeks of critical temperatures that we get through. So that is one uh, observation. The second is, your one and a half degree, three degree prediction, if it was true, why did Delhi ever go to 49 degrees? When I was a young man here, I'll tell you, it, it was a lovely place to be. So it went up by almost 10 degrees in the last 20, 25 years. So we need to ask that question where we live, that do we trust scientists outside the country or we, we want to do our own things within our local jurisdiction where we are? Because the more you're prepared, the better you are in managing the physical assets that you design, as opposed to taking something from somewhere else. So, Arindam, same questions. Yeah, so, so, so I was, while you guys were talking, I was Googling. Um, so from 2012 to 2021, you are right. It is, uh, it is an increase of 1.5. But there are sudden spikes that is not showing up. Like your 40 degrees, that's a... That's something that I'm seeing here, but I'm not sure about India, but let me tell you where I stay. Where I stay in California, first of all, it was supposed to be a drought state. Now it is not a drought state, it is a flooded state. In January and February, the amount of rainfall that has happened, it, is, it has never happened before. The amount of temperature drops that we are seeing between the morning and evening is in that order of 10 degrees. That's huge. So the, the reason why I said about Delhi is because I don't follow the trend, but I think in US we are seeing exactly the same thing. Seattle, why do you think everyone brings an umbrella in Seattle? Because it rains all the time. Now, when you see the trend of what Seattle had in the last one and a half years, only there were four days when it rained. So you, that will have a temperature of 10 degree variation. So, so I hope I answered that question from a different view. Professor, uh, you I, yes. If you standardize something, it should be valid for each and everybody. And I think this is a problem. Um, with the current temperature levels we have in the standard in Germany, we can live quite well. We never lost the transformer because of overloads. Yeah? So although operators say, I do not want to overload them because, because they can explode. It never happened before in Germany. Nevertheless, they are anxious. If we would increase the, 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 the or decrease the temperatures of the transformer, yeah, um, then we would lose material and, and money for, for these, let's say, higher temperature transformers. But in case of India, this is maybe different. 
Do you know how many percentage of transformers fail due to overload? And if this is a significant number, of course, then you have to adapt the temperatures which you use for the designing of your transformers. So this is, I would say, strongly a question of the region where you are and not a worldwide decision. Stephen, I have one question for you. So in uh, where you are, um, what is the emergency rating of the transformer you guys use? Because, because that's how the overload is defined, especially for distribution and substation transformers. It's not the normal rating, it's the emergency rating. Some of the utilities go to 120%. Yeah. So in US, and you can tell about Canada, it, it is huge, it average across 3,000 utilities is about 150 to 160. There are some so utilities like consumers which is going to run it at up to 230 percent. So it varies but, quite a bit. But, but you have to take into account for what time you use this overload. The That's LTR, the plan. LTR so rating, 4 hour rating, 8 hour rating, 6 hour rating. That is correct. Yeah. So the 120 percent is for continuous overloading, yeah? So in, in case of shorter times, of course, there are also higher values. But I will have to say this situation normally never occurs in Germany, yeah? So it's quite a theoretical value. Okay. Well, on that note, not that we have a conclusion, but I think, Reji, you got more work to do. This discussion that we had from Bhuvaneshwar last year, I posed it as the same question, and I think we need to keep this up to say what is the solution for South Asia and Southeast Asia, especially, and Africa. I don't see Adele here, but, uh, and you know, what is our solution for this part of the world to be able to manage climate change due to rising ambient temperatures, people's aspirations, the electric vehicles that are coming on, and the fact that cooling load is increasing at a phenomenal rate because of, you know, personal lifestyle changes. So, right, so, so you, got more, you got more work here. So with that, I'll bring the session to a close. Thank a nice round of applause for our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you, session moderator and uh, speakers, for your deliberations on that relevant theme. Uh, may I request Mr. Reggie Pillay to please join us on stage and present the mementos to our speakers. To our session moderator and then to Mr. Stephen Ten Bolen. To Mr. Arindam Maitra and to Mr. Faizan Khan. And may I request everyone to kindly pose for a group photograph. <laughs>